Good morning. Thanks for coming for IMU Med Talk series. Uh, Prof. Daryl White is a professor of medicine and senior associate dean, faculty of medicine and hematologist at Queen Elizabeth II Health Sciences Center. So he will be giving a uh, talk on multiple myeloma review and therapeutics update. Hopefully it will be more helpful for SAM2 students because they have to cover multiple myeloma on their own. So let's start. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Nice to see uh, lots of students out. Um, so uh, I, I didn't realize that uh, you have to cover this on your own, so, uh, so I guess that's a good thing. Um, I did divide the talk actually a little bit differently than I typically would do. So usually what I, this is what I do in practice and what I do in research. Usually what I talk about is therapeutics because therapeutics are changing quite a lot of myeloma, but I have started with uh, um, about half the talk is background uh, and sort of um, telling you about myeloma, how to diagnose, how to, how, to, um, how to manage initially, that sort of thing. And then we'll get into some of the higher tech therapeutics, which I found quite interesting and hopefully you will too. Um, and, I'll, and then at the end, I'll try to tell you um, why, why this is important. Has it made a difference? Are we just spending lots of money and, and not uh, really achieving much? Um, so that's my plan for the day. Disclosures are here. I do work with uh, a number of pharmaceutical companies that are developing new drugs in myeloma. I don't think it has any particular bearing on what I'm going to say today. And I uh, also begin with a couple shots of, uh, of Halifax. Um, this is Dalhousie University. Uh, just celebrated a, a 200th anniversary in the medical school, 150 years. Um, this is looking out across the peninsula of Halifax. This, there's lots of houses here. You can't see them for the trees and uh, across into the Atlantic Ocean. And this is, um, I live across the bridge actually from Halifax, across the harbor. This is the area where I live. Um, we're back onto this lake, so it's nice for boating and swimming in the summer and uh, skating in the winter. And I showed this to the semester two students yesterday. Um, they weren't able to name any of the hockey players. Um, they might have just been shy and just keeping it to themselves, I think. But, um, but these, these, these three guys are probably the premier hockey players currently in the North American Professional League, which is the NHL. Um, and uh, they all happen to be from, from where I'm from. Um, in fact, I went to school with his father. That's Sidney Crosby, who's probably been the best player in the, in the, in the world for the last 10 years. Um, although he's, he's now about 30, so he's getting old uh, for a hockey player. Um, and these, these three guys are playing for the national team, and uh, the national team tends to do very well, and they, they won this particular tournament. So again, formally what I'm just going to discuss today is myeloma pathophysiology. I'll spend a bit of time on diagnosis and prognosis. Um, I'll tell you about Canadian management. I, I don't know anything about management in this, in this part of the world, but um, I, think it's, uh, I think it's actually fairly similar. Um, we'll have a look forward. The, the major hematology meeting occurred just this past week in uh, San Diego. And um, a number of the things I can tell you about uh, were just, just uh, shown there. Um, and um, finally, as I said, I'll demonstrate that some of these advances have improved survival. Hopefully I'll demonstrate that. Um, so we'll begin with, uh, with B cells. So we talked a little bit about this yesterday with the semester two students. And uh, the process of B cell maturation is important in terms of understanding myeloma. So again, if you sort of visually think about this being bone marrow where things start, this being lymph nodes where um, lymphocytes are exposed to antigens and they really develop um, and um, you know, create diversity in terms of what we need in terms of our, our um, humoral immunity. Um, it all starts as uh, B cell precursors with some re recombination that's planned. So you end up with an immature B cell that can produce IgM. Um, that B cell then moves into the, into the lymph node. It's exposed to antigens, further matures, um, and there is planned again uh, hypermutation of the genetic material and uh, based in part on antigen selection. So, so which antigens the cell is exposed to determine what it, what it develops into. That occurs um, as the cell moves into the germinal center of the lymph node and, um, and then back into the bone marrow again with uh, heavy chain class switching. So that's all the planned events. Um, myeloma in particular is characterized by abnormal plasma cells typically in the bone marrow and they're derived from post-germinal center B cells. So that's, that's our starting point. 
And here's an image of, uh, of immunoglobins or antibodies. Um, just visually, keep in mind, IgG is a monomer, IgA is a dimer, and IgM is a, is a pentamer. So, so five individual immunoglobin chains stuck together. It's important because uh, that makes IgM a very large molecule. If you have a lot of IgM in your body, if you have more than you should, uh, your blood can become viscous thick and that produces symptoms. Typically that doesn't happen with IgG. It's a, it's a much smaller molecule as it's not bound together. So essentially we have heavy chains with that are shown here in blue and light chains in green um, and the structure is the same for each of these. Heavy chains are G, A, M, D or E and in, myelom in the myeloma world really the two common things are IgG and IgA uh, in terms of the cells producing um, abnormal proteins. And then the light chains are either kappa or lambda, so again in green. Variable regions up here, constant regions down here, and the, the setup is really the same for each of the uh, immunoglobin classes. So then moving on to the abnormal situation. So if you have a clone of plasma cells, so all the, all the cells are the same, they've become um, immortal, uh, they all make the same immunoglobin protein. And if enough is made, it can be detected in the uh, blood and or urine. Um, that's, I'll show you some of the tests in a minute. In blood and urine, that's protein electrophoresis. So you've probably had some experience with that. It's basically separation of proteins based on size and charge. So you take, in this case, a, a drop of uh, serum, add it to a plate, or, or in this case, it's a, um, it's a commercial product, a little piece of plastic and that a charge is applied for a set amount of time and proteins move based on size and charge. And then staining happens and what you stain it with determines what you see. So I'll show you a couple examples in a minute. So the two tests that are, that are basic here are the protein electrophoresis and then immunofixation. The difference between the two is how you stain it and I'll show you a couple examples of that. Um, a newer test is available as well which is different. It's, it's not based on electrophoresis, it's a direct measurement of, of light chains in a very um, sensitive way. So it's called free light chain assay. You can do it in serum or urine. And it detects light chains unattached to heavy chains. So in our bodies, typically we would have, um, you know, a flux of, uh, of light chains that are attached or unattached. Most, most are attached. But it turns out it's very helpful actually to measure the, um, the unattached. And in myeloma, you may see an absolute increase in either kappa or lambda, free light chains. Probably most sensitive and most importantly, you get a ra ratio that's abnormal. The, the normals are shown there, not particularly important, but it's an almost one-to-one -one ratio normally. And if it becomes skewed in one direction or the other, that would suggest that there's an overproduction of one or the other of the uh, light chains. So this is an electrophoretic pattern. Um, this is uh, this is sort of the the uh, movement of the proteins um, on a gel, and then light is applied. So this is a dense tometry tracing of of an actual electrophoresis. The electrophoresis looks like this. If you apply light, the denser the band, the higher the peak. Okay, and this one's nice to show because it shows normal in green. This is a normal pattern from albumin. Um, the rest are just named arbitrarily, so alpha 1, alpha 2, beta, and gamma. And most labs would separate beta into beta 1 and beta 2. Um, the, the proteins we're talking about, for the most part, travel in the gamma region. Um, doesn't mean they're IgG. So this, this test does not identify the type of protein. It just identifies whether the pattern is abnormal or normal. This is a nice bell-shaped curve in the gamma protein, that in the gamma region. That means that the proteins are of differing size, essentially differing size and charge. So you have a variety of proteins there. You can see here in the red, this is a characteristic spike of myeloma. So suggesting that the proteins now are traveling really to the same small area. There's a lot of them, so the peak's higher. But um, because the, ba the band is narrow, it's got a narrow base, it's like uh, described as a church spire, um, these proteins are all of the same type. So if you have monoclonal proteins, they're all the same, they travel the same distance because they're the same size and charge. And that's what that represents. So again, if the actual gel tracing here, you apply light, 
and this is what you may see. So you can see this band is narrow and dark, and that corresponds to the monoclonal protein. So that's serum protein electrophoresis. If you do it in the urine, it's urine protein electrophoresis. The proteins in your urine are different than in your serum, so the tracing itself looks different, but uh, the same principles. Now this is um, an immunofixation slide, and uh, at the top here is just a straightforward protein electrophoresis. All of the proteins present are stained. The difference in these other lanes is that an, an anti-human IgG has been applied to this lane, anti-human IgA to this one, anti-human IgM, etc. And where this abnormal band is will show up depending on which anti-human immunoglobin you apply. So in this case, uh, IgA looks empty, IgM looks empty, lambda looks empty, but there's something corresponding to this at IgG and at kappa. So that would tell you that there's a monoclonal protein by serum protein electrophoresis that, um, that um, by immunofixation electrophoresis is IgG kappa. So this patient has monoclonal IgG kappa protein in their blood. So there, there are a variety of conditions that um, one can have a monoclonal protein. We talked yesterday about the lymphocytic uh, malignancies, and uh, any of those can produce a monoclonal protein. But it's um, quite characteristic of the uh, monoclonal gammopathies. So monoclonal gammopathy just means that there's abnormal protein in the blood. And then the first condition is called monoclonal gammopathy of undetermined significance, which is kind of a meaningless name. It's just uh, something made up. Um, it originally was called benign monoclonal gammopathy because there wasn't a great understanding of what the cause of it was. Um, in fact, it is a cancer, so this is a clonal proliferation of cells producing a protein. Um, the reason it was called benign is that usually it doesn't turn into clinical disease. Okay? Name's been changed because sometimes it does, so that's where the undetermined comes in. Um, so essentially, it's a monoclonal protein without evidence of myeloma or actual clinical disease. But at a rate of about 1% to 2% per year, initially, um, it, it may evolve into multiple myeloma. If it's been recognized and it doesn't convert over the first 5 to 10 years, the rate actually drops, and, um, and it's unlikely to convert. Um, but the condition requires regular follow-up. Typically, this is a patient we might see in our clinic and then refer back to the family doctor for the uh, lifelong follow-up that follows. So this is, wouldn't be a patient typically that a hematologist would follow. So um, some of this I already mentioned, but uh, myeloma commonly is associated with IgG or IgA or just free light chains possibly. Um, IgM more commonly, if it's monoclonal, is more commonly seen with um, a condition that we br touched on briefly yesterday, so Waldenstrom's macroglobinemia uh, or lymphocytic <coughs> lymphoma. Uh, it's the difference between a pathologic and a clinical diagnosis. Um, can rarely be seen in myeloma. And likewise, IgG, IgD or IgE um, myeloma can rarely be seen. Um, you know, in a, in a practice where, where I would see myeloma patients uh, every day, um, we'd probably see a couple patients with IgD myeloma in a year. And in 20 years of doing this, uh, I think I've probably met two patients with IgE myeloma. So those are relatively rare. Um, rarely, the uh, plasma cells might make no antibody. So that tends not to be the case, but it could happen. So basically myeloma, multiple myeloma, is an accumulation of malignant plasma cells in the marrow leading to end organ damage. And I'll tell you in a minute what those end organs uh, might be and how they're damaged. There's a condition between MGUS, or monoclonal gammopathy under term significance, and multiple myeloma. So it's kind of a spectrum that patients might um, move through. If you develop multiple myeloma, it may not have been recognized, but you began as having MGUS, and then you had smoldering, and then you had multiple myeloma. That's been shown from large American um, military databases. Um, so smoldering myeloma basically is an increase in plasma cell burden over MGUS or an increase in the monoclonal protein, but still no overt end organ damage. It does have a higher rate of progression to myeloma than MGUS, so about 10% over the first five years. So you can see about 50% of recognized patients progress over the first five years. 
and then it uh, drops down. So after about 10 years, it drops back to the MGUS rate, about 1% per year. And um, what we do with these patients typically is follow them for the first five years or so. If they don't progress, then refer them back to the family doctor. Um, so uh, we talked a little bit about genetic changes in lymphoma yesterday. Myeloma has recognized genetic changes. It's a little bit behind in terms of um, recognition and really what these things mean. But um, first point is myeloma actually is not one disease. That's probably why the treatment is uh, somewhat complex, somewhat difficult. Not everybody responds to every treatment, et cetera. Um, it's been uh, referred to as multiple myelomas with an S. Um, there's at least seven subtypes in terms of what we know now based on cytogenetic changes for the most part. And there are higher risk um, features or higher risk cytogenetic changes that are recognized, including these ones, which I won't really delve into, but this is how they're recognized. So this is a, a fish image, single cell, um, stained for IGH. We talked a little bit about that yesterday on, on chromosome 14. So that's the gene that produces the heavy chains. And in this case, FGFR3 um, uh, site, uh, if those come together, you get a translocation 414 predicts a poor prognosis for the, for the patient. Likewise, if you're missing a portion of the 17th chromosome, 17P deletion, um, predicts a poor prognosis. And this is quite interesting um, in that uh, patients, this is work done by, um, by a, actually a Canadian group who are in uh, Scottsdale, Arizona now, I think for the weather. Um, but uh, they, they showed that uh, this is a single patient, the different colors, you can't see the detail here, but the different colors in that pie graph represent different clones of their, of their disease found at baseline, found at diagnosis. So the patient had uh, a normal karyotype number, but a number of translocations and, and uh, some deletions. So what happened over time is they treated this patient, this is the lifespan of the patient, and what happened to their clones is essentially some of the clones would respond to the treatment. So you can see in this case, the red clone decreased, and then when they used something else, the red clone went way down. But instead, they had predominance of a green clone on relapse. So at each relapse, there's a different picture in terms of what's dominating the, the cytogenetic profile. And it turns out that uh, these different um, phenotypes respond differently to treatment, okay? so problem is you can't know that at the outset. So they didn't know when they measured this patient's uh, cytogenetic profile at relapse one that this green clone would respond well to this drug they gave her called uh, carfilzomib. Um, and what happens eventually is that the patient develops the end stage of myeloma, in this case plasma cell leukemia. You can't see it, but what predominates is this blue clone. It's present actually at the diagnosis. So what the patient died from, the disease they died from was actually present initially. Um, this is called clonal tiding. So cl clones come, clones go. It uh, suggests that patients may respond to drugs they had stopped responding to previously. So as a clone goes away and then later comes back to dominate, um, it's possible that they'll respond to the same treatment again. Suggests that um, keeping pressure on the clone at all times is important, meaning that uh, the trend now is to treat until progression. So we don't give drugs for a fixed period of time and then a drug holiday. So there's not the previous idea of giving um, treatment for a set period of time. This is now um, really lifelong treatment. Okay. Epidemiology, just briefly, uh, this, this is a relatively unusual cancer in terms of overall cancer types. So this is not up there with breast cancer, lung cancer prostate cancer, et cetera. Um, but in the hematology world, it is important. So this, this disease makes up about 10% of the cancers that a hematologist would see. Um, it uh, is important in terms of treatment because treatment advances have happened very quickly and um, along with that expense. Additionally, this is actually the most common reason to perform a stem cell transplant. So uh, if a patient's young enough and fit enough, uh, the first line treatment is still high dose chemotherapy with stem cell transplant. Okay, so, so uh, and this would, this would make up, at my center we do about 130 or so transplants in a year. We would do somewhere in the range of 30 or 40 my myeloma transplants. Um, 
The rest of it's shown here. Uh, there is a slight male predominance age of diagnosis in the mid-60s, so this is a condition of older people typically. Um, relatives are a little more frequent, frequent in terms of uh, likelihood of developing myeloma, but it isn't directly inherited. So patients will usually ask, you know, are my children at risk? Is my brother at risk, et cetera? Um, and, and they are at slightly more risk, but it's not a direct inheritance type cancer. Um, there is, there is a difference in terms of ethnic groups. So I uh, said here African, it's actually people of African descent. I don't know that that's true in Africa, but it's true what's been studied actually is African American population um, at about twice the risk of a non-Hispanic Caucasian population, <coughs> greater risk than uh, an Asian population. The Asian population predominantly that's been studied is uh, Jap Japan. Um, and there are a number of myeloma centers in Japan despite the fact that it's less frequent than, uh, than elsewhere. Annual incidence, about four or five per 100,000. Um, and there isn't really a known cause or known inciting event. Um, it is more frequent if you look at, for example, uh, the first responders to the 9-11 event in, in uh, New York. Um, so something, some toxin that those people were exposed to led to an increased risk of lymphoid malignancy, including myeloma. <coughs> Clinical features shown here, um, probably the three that I would focus on are anemia, unexplained otherwise. It shows up to the family doctor. Bone pain uh, or pathologic fractures. Typically, what uh, a family doctor would see is a patient presenting with back pain. Um, and the problem the family doctor has is distinguishing mechanical back pain, which is very common, from malignant back pain. So the back pain here may be due to compression fractures, it may be due to uh, just bone destruction. And um, the characteristic is that uh, mechanical back pain typically resolves with rest. There's usually an inciting event where the patient knows that this comes and goes over time if they do something particular. Um, tends to be more muscle pain. This is a bone pain, so this, this is typically constant. Um, it's worse with movement and it doesn't tend to go away. It tends to get worse over time. Uh, unless there's a compression fracture, in which case the bone heals over about six weeks or so, back pain gets better, but then it may recur. Um, so there is some trouble figuring out what's real, what's not real, but what's mechanical back pain versus pathologic uh, fractures in this case. Fatigue is common. Fatigue is tough because virtually everything causes fatigue and probably most people are fatigued at some point. Um, and some people are fatigued all the time for for other reasons. Um, so there's nothing really pathognomonic in terms of the symptoms. Um, in terms of making the diagnosis, so you need a combination of pathologic features and radiographic features and clinical features. So the pathologic, you, you need to show that there are uh, monoclonal or neoplastic plasma cells in marrow or in soft tissue in, in a, a lesser number of patients. Um, and then the end organ damage is so-called crab criteria, so listed here uh, with the little crab shown to help you remember. And what's changed now, I've made the crab skinny, um, so-called slim crab criteria. This is as of a couple of years ago, okay? So the definition of myeloma actually was changed. And what was recognized is some of, some of those patients that we refer to as smoldering were actually ultra-high risk smoldering, meaning that they were likely to evolve into myeloma within two years, and they had these features when they were looked at. So they had a high percentage of plasma cells, even though they didn't have symptoms at that point. They had a light chain ratio that was over 100 when you looked at the involved versus uninvolved. That's what INU stands for. And if you did an MRI scan, even though they had nothing on a, on a plain x-ray, on a bone scan, on a bone survey, um, not a bone scan, um, if you did an MRI scan, they had more than one bone lesion, or at least one bone lesion. So those patients now, even though they might be asymptomatic, are considered to be myeloma. So, so you need the neoplastic plasma cells demonstrated from some tissue, doesn't necessarily have to be bone marrow, and you need slim crab criteria, so crab plus the slim part, okay? This is an image of a bone marrow sample showing 
one type of cell. Whenever you see monotony in, uh, in a bone marrow, it's a bad thing. So there should be lots of heterogeneity. You can see these cells, if you even if you don't know what they are, they all look more or less the same. They've got the same type of nucleus. They've got the same type of cytoplasm. They're all plasma cells. This is an x-ray, plain film x-ray, uh, sideways of someone's skull and, and of their humerus. And the thing we're looking at are these punched out lesions or areas of hypodensity, meaning bone destruction. Uh, fairly classic picture. This is one of my patients from a number of years ago. This is a an x-ray of her humerus. Um, it's bright in here, but uh, basically if the lights were down, you can see her shoulder here, her clavicle. If you look hard, actually, you can see a couple little hypodense areas here in the clavicle. Those are lytic lesions. Likewise, in this rib, you can see some lytic lesions. You can't see her humerus, and that's because her humerus is replaced by tumor. So there is no humerus to see, actually. Um, so she had uh, presumably still bone there. It was just that it was a big lytic lesion. Um, and again, you can see other lytic lesions into her humerus, into her scapula there, rather. And this is post-treatment. Uh, so it's a very abnormal looking humerus now, um, but the bone is, has uh, reformed and um, it, her arm is quite functional actually. She, she did need to go to physio, but uh, she has full range of motion. And she's done well over about a 10 year period. So, uh, so a nice success story. And then just to finish with the crab, so renal dysfunction. There's actually a variety of ways that myeloma, myeloma can cause renal dysfunction. The classic and probably most common is cast nephropathy. And basically this is uh, too much light chain being um, sent through the nephron so that it overwhelms the nephron and forms a cast. And there's, there's um, uh, I never really understood TAM Horsfeld proteins, but this is the importance in my life of TAM Horsfeld proteins. So they bind the, the light chains. It forms um, a, a complex, this so-called cast, blocks the nephron, and the nephron doesn't function and, and dies. Um, this is one mechanism. There, there are others, such as ATN, which is a little more nonspecific, so acute tubular necrosis, um, hypercalcemia in and it of itself through probably dehydration and direct toxicity causes renal dysfunction too. And amyloidosis, which is a related condition, can cause uh, renal dysfunction. So the workup, you need to do uh, basically take away from things I've said already, demonstrate the monoclonal protein, demonstrate the clonal plasma cells, look for evidence of end organ damage, remember the slim crab criteria, and then do some prognostication. So you want to look at albumin and beta-2 microglobulin, which is actually how we stage myeloma. And then in terms of prognosis, FISH is probably most important right now. So FISH being done on the bone marrow. This is staging, which I won't really dwell on, but it's pretty simple. Uh, you measure beta-2 microglobulin from blood and you measure albumin. If they're both abnormal, um, or sorry, if, if the beta-2 is over a certain level, then that suggests stage three with the median survival shown there. If they're both normal, um, then median survival is in the range of five years. Um, these aren't that useful when you're sitting in front of a patient because these would predict the survival of, uh, say, 100 people. This is the median. The problem sitting in front of one person is you don't know if they're going to fall to the left or the right of the median. Um, so it's, it's an individual um, bit of information that's not that useful. Treatment overview, I'm going to go into a little detail in a moment, but the drugs that we use commonly are still glucocorticoids, so plain old prednisone or dexamethasone. We do use them in big doses, so I routinely get calls from pharmacists who say, do you really want to prescribe 40 milligrams of dexamethasone every day for four days? And the answer is yes. So that's a, that's a big dose of uh, steroid, um, equivalent to about 250 milligrams of prednisone or prednisolone. Um, chemotherapy, old-style chemotherapy, melphalan and cyclophosphamide. We've moved into um, newer agents, novel therapies, so-called. We can't really call them that anymore because they're coming so fast that what's novel now is, uh, you know, outdated uh, two years from now. Um, but the two main classes of drugs that we we're using these days are a drug class called proteasome inhibitors, which um, are particularly important in this class of cell because basically what it does is turn off the cell's ability to dispose of excess protein. So the cell goes into an apoptotic state because of excess protein that it can't normally 
get rid of. Um, we have three drugs currently available in that class listed there. And then secondly, the other major class is so-called immunomodulatory agents. Um, when you see a name like that, probably means we don't really know what they do, which is probably true. So thalidomide um, was the uh, initial drug in this class. So thalidomide has been around for many years. You might remember thalidomide being given to pregnant women in the 50s and 60s, producing birth defects, uh, which wasn't recognized until later. The, the drug um, remained on the American market for treatment of leprosy. I don't know if it was on the market elsewhere in the world, but um, the story of thalidomide is very interesting. In, in uh, I actually happened to be doing my fellowship in Little Rock, Arkansas in 97 and 98, and um, thalidomide was on the market. There was a physician with um, myeloma that came to that center um, and, uh, and asked that thalidomide be tried because it had anti-angiogenic properties, and he believed that that would shut off the myeloma. Happened to work and a clinical trial was done showing that thalidomide was effective, and that was really the first new agent. So in 1998, that trial was published in New England Journal, and um, that was the first new agent since the mid-60s for myeloma. And then it's uh, spun very quickly since then, but these two drugs are derivatives, derivatives of thalidomide. They work much better. They're much more potent drugs. And then we've more recently gotten into monoclonal antibodies in myeloma, so we have two available, and there are many more coming. And then finally, stem cell transplant I mentioned briefly. So treatment strategies, I'm going to shift gears now and move into uh, therapeutics. Um, any questions on diagnosis, prognosis before I do that? So if you do, feel free to interrupt me. But in principle, um, we use drugs in combination. That's where a lot of the research is being done right now. So the way cancer drugs are typically developed is they're tried as single agents in very advanced uh, disease. You're looking for drugs that aren't too toxic and might have some efficacy. And then as uh, the drug is shown to be effective and not too toxic, it moves from very advanced disease to less advanced disease in, and then eventually to newly diagnosed patients. And as that's done, it's often combined with other agents that have different mechanisms of action. So you want to uh, attack the cancer with drugs of varying mechanisms to hit some of those different clones that I mentioned. And the principle that I mentioned already is generally we treat until progression with the drug. And then we might use it again, but usually not. So if in a younger fit patient, um, you want to get them to remission as quickly as possible to avoid complications. You want to keep them in remission as long as possible. And you want to have a very deep remission. Um, typically, that does involve stem cell transplant as at least the first treatment and we use maintenance drugs after the stem cell transplant. In an older or unfit patient, the um, plan is to achieve remission with minimal toxicity. Um, you usually have a longer time to achieve the remission, although, again, the combinations of drugs we're using these days are very effective and work very quickly. Uh, there might be shorter remissions, and again, it's continuous therapy. And what's shown on the right is um, is a bit of theory, but uh, basically it's showing that um, there are measures of deeper remissions than complete remission in myeloma. So the um, definitions of remission in myeloma are somewhat historic. So complete remission, um, that definition goes back 20 or 30 years. It basically meant at the time that you couldn't detect any myeloma. Now, some of those tests that I mentioned have improved and uh, gotten more sensitive over time. So there's actually a definition that we do use clinically now called stringent complete remission, which means that not only is there no myeloma detectable by the classic tests, the free light chain test is, is normal as well. So that's stringent complete remission. And then the big band here, MRD, stands for minimal residual disease. So again, more sensitive tests have been developed. So for example, flow cytometry, looking at markers on the individual cells, or next generation sequencing, looking at uh, the, the immune content of the cells, and you can measure to very low levels. So this is 10 to the minus 5 down to 10 to the minus 8 or so. And as these tests get better, we'll be, ab be able to measure deeper remissions. And then we get into undetectable. That's undetectable currently. And again, as these tests evolve and get better, we'll probably find diff different, better ways to, um, to measure. But basically, when you get into the undetectable levels currently, we think there's still disease present. 
So even though we can't measure it, we think it's still there. And that's what this is trying to represent, is that a patient might achieve, for example, a complete remission, and then relapse happens relatively quickly, versus if you get down to a very deep remission, you can see that the remission may last longer. That's, that's essentially, that's the theory. And eventually we think that patients may get down into levels of disease so, so low that um, the relapse may not happen in their lifetime. So they'll live out a normal lifespan, die of other conditions um, as, as one would normally. Supportive care very briefly, so blood transfusions, uh, sometimes stimulating agents, so either erythropoietin or, or um, granulocyte stimulating agent are the two that we have available. Um, we do do things to uh, strengthen bones, so bisphosphonates are used. We, we typically use the strong intravenous bisphosphonates. Radiation plays a role, particularly for bone disease. Um, spinal cord compression can occur, so this is when tumor or bone pushes into the spinal cord. It's an emergency. Um, typically a combination of radiation therapy, sometimes surgical decompression, and then coming in with uh, the systemic therapy or the chemotherapy relatively quickly. Infections are a problem, and commonly pneumococcal uh, infection and influenza are, are two of the big ones we worry about. And you can vaccinate for both of those, obviously. Um, this is the typical course of disease over a patient's lifetime. So I mentioned that they begin with the smoldering or undetectable level of myeloma eventually becomes active, you treat them, they go down to into a remission, there's a relapse, remission, relapse, remission, eventually they hit a refractory point where the drugs that we have available don't work anymore and patients then die of uh, disease complications. Usually renal failure or infection are the two most common. Um, so this is a publication from 1998 which uh, might seem like a lifetime ago to some of you. To me, it's uh, when I started practicing. Um, so to me, it doesn't feel that long ago. Um, at that time, this, this is a study looking at a meta-analysis of all the various chemotherapy combinations that were compared to MP is melphalan, which is an old chemotherapy drug, oral, and prednisone. That's a very simple treatment, been around since the mid-60s. And there were about 20 years of um, of studies that uh, had shown no difference in terms of overall survival. Overall survival at that time was about two and a half years, taking all patients, all comers, um, and what's happened since then. So this is an editorial from now 2016, a couple of years ago. Dr. Robert Kyle is sort of one of the uh, predominant figures in, in myeloma. He's, he's now in his mid-90s, still working at the Mayo Clinic, and uh, began publishing in myeloma in the 1950s. Um, so this is one of his more recent publications along with one of his more junior members who's, who's um, not that junior. Um, but what they had to say is that in the past decade we've witnessed more progress in trebinal multiple myeloma than any other cancer. And I'll show you a little bit of that and tell you why they said that. So some of the milestones. So again, nothing much happened actually from the 60s all through to the, to the 90s. Um, and um, transplant came along and became common in the, um, in the mid-90s. And then there were some tweaks done, but, but really what we had at that point was melphalan, prednisone, and transplant. And then this whole series of drugs came very quickly. And this is just an example of these drugs making a difference. This is data from the Mayo Clinic. Patients exposed to some of these new drugs, patients not. Obviously, there's bias here because it's a retrospective cohort comparison of patients who got some treatment, patients who didn't, but there's a clear uh, difference in survival too. And I'll show you some more convincing data in a minute. This is what we do for myeloma. So this, this uh, so I've said in Nova Scotia, but this, this is really the standard in Canada. Um, fairly similar to what would be done in the US uh, with some, some notable changes or, or differences. But down the left-hand side here is what we do in terms of a, what we consider to be a younger or more fit patient. Um, they're a candidate for a Tolgus stem cell transplant. The patient receives a chemotherapy induction to lower the burden of disease, get them ready for transplant. We mobilize stem cells with a bit more chemotherapy and high doses of growth factor. And then we give them a high dose of chemotherapy, thaw out those stem cells, and give the stem cells back. The whole point of the transplant is actually allowing the patient to survive this lethal dose of chemotherapy. So if you gave only the chemotherapy, not the stem cells, the patient would die of bone marrow ecclesia. So they'd die of, of 
infection most likely, but they'd need transfusional support until that point. Um, there's some detail here that I won't go into, but after the patient goes through the transplant, we do offer maintenance therapy. Maintenance therapy extends the remission. You don't cure anybody with this uh, procedure, so this is not curative intent. This is meant to produce a remission that's long, and the patient has a relatively long first remission with this, this type of um, scenario. If the patient chooses not to go through transplant or they're not a candidate for various reasons, for us, including age, um, they go through this, this list. Um, first line we're using currently is lenalidomide and dexamethasone. That's one of those imid drugs. Um, pretty simple treatment. It's oral, um, works for most people. And we have a couple alternatives if, if we so choose or if that doesn't work. Then we move into second line, third line, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, which, which really are combining different classes of drugs in different ways and treating until the next relapse. Um, obviously, how long someone lives, in part, depends on how many lines of treatment we have to offer them. Okay? So as new drugs are developed, they're added in, and we get patients out to many lines of treatment sometimes. Um, just in terms of principles, early death still occurs, so about 20% of patients die within the first two years of their treatment, so many patients don't go on to benefit from those later lines that I mentioned. Uh, first remission tends to be the longest. Not always the case, but it's usually the case, and as typically associated with the state of best state of well-being. Um, further treatment, sort of second line plus, might be complicated by advancing age, comorbidities, other problems that crop up. Um, and relapse is difficult for patients, um, sort of physically, but also emotionally, financially, et cetera. So despite ongoing um, work and options, increasing options, we do still have fit patients who simply have no more treatment to, uh, to be considered. Um, and at that point, survival is brief, and I'll show you that briefly. Um, some of the principles are here, too. So patients respond best. This is a general chemotherapy principle. Patients respond best to the first-line treatment and diminishing returns as you move out through many lines of treatment. That's shown here as uh, response duration. It's shown here as overall <coughs> survival, but the same idea. This is um, more recent data, interesting, I think. Um, essentially shows, again, the best treatment is the first treatment. So we get about 95% of patients from diagnosis to first-line treatment, but we only go we only get about 60% uh, of patients to second-line treatment. That's because some patients do very well. They only need one line of treatment. They die of other causes. Um, however, some patients die of the myeloma between first-line and second-line. Um, some patients are not fit enough to move on to second-line. And as you move into fifth-line, only 1% of patients that we began with at diagnosis actually get to fifth-line. Um, if you ask clinicians what these numbers might be, they have a very skewed idea. So I, so I feel like most of my patients get down into fourth and fifth line, but it's, it's probably not true. And there's a variety of studies here that essentially show the same thing. This is a Canadian study based on an, an Alberta database that uh, shows what we're achieving, which is about 50% of patients moving from first line to second line. Move into briefly treatment. I won't uh, go into a great deal of um, detail here, but uh, th this is the study that showed that something was better than melphalan and prednisone. I showed you that meta-analysis from 1998 that said nothing was better to that point. This was the first indication that if you added something to melphalan and prednisone, in, case in this case the T is thalidomide, you improved um, EFS's event-free survival or progression-free survival essentially, so likelihood of being alive and not relapsing. So that was a flash by the year 2006. 2007, this is now a French group. The first was Italian. A uh, French group that showed, again, adding thalidomide to melphalan and prednisone produced a better overall survival. That's the first time an improvement in overall survival was shown since melphalan and prednisone in the 1960s. Um, and then this is, again, another trial now adding Velcade or bortezomib, that's a proteasome inhibitor, to melphalan and prednisone. And again, predictably, I'm showing you because it's positive, 2008, so we had sort of three big trials come out in, se in series in that time, um, showing that um, patients without an event, so without relapse, was better if you gave Velcade along with melphalan and prednisone. And the survival data, so there's a survival advantage. So now we have 
a couple different ways that patients could be treated. This, is, this was a large trial. I put this, this uh, accrual slide up, so this is called the first trial. At the time, this was the largest trial in myeloma that had been done uh, ever, published in 2013, so now we're getting a little more recent. Put it up because Canada made a, a major contribution to this study, so, so really uh, 250 patients. French, um, it was a French-based study. Uh, they, they put the majority of the patients in. The expectation at the outset was that Canada would be a minor player in the United States, would put most of the patients in. Practice in the United States is very different than Canada in terms of um, drug availability. So the reason Canada did very well is that basically this was our access to that drug. Um, the trial design is a little bit complicated, but essentially what they did was compare lenalidomide, the drug with steroid, to melphalan, prednisone, and thalidomide that I showed you already had been proven better than melphalan and prednisone. So now we're going one step further. And again, it's a positive trial. There's an advantage to uh, using the lenalidomide dexamethasone over the previous standard that shows up in terms of relapse uh, and also in terms of survival. And now we're moving on a step further than that. So now we're taking the current standard. This is actually still our standard in Canada, lenalidomide and dexamethasone or revlimid and dexamethasone. And now we're combining a prednisone inhibitor there. The V is Velcade or bortezomib. So so now you have an imid drug, a proteasome inhibitor drug, and to cut to the chase and skip some of the detail, basically what was shown is that if you put the drugs with two different uh, mechanisms together, you improve progression-free survival. So now we're getting into um, almost a doubling of some of the studies I showed you initially, uh, not that many years previous, and advantage in terms of overall survival. So now we're getting overall survivals. I showed you f that first study about two and a half years, so about 30 months. Now we're into 75 months as medians, okay? We have a monoclonal antibody, so this is an antibody directed against CD38. CD38 was important because it's on plasma cells and it's not on much else, okay? So now you have a, a therapy that can um, attach to plasma cells, work in a variety of ways, that's what this sort of mess is showing. Um, but basically it's showing that this drug functions through all of the immune mechanisms that we have normally. In addition, it modifies how your body sees the cancer through T cells and B cells. So basically that's, that's what the drug is said to do. And essentially now we're gonna start adding the drug to different combinations. So this was a combination of Velcade, Melphalan, and Prednisone with the addition of the Daratubumab now. And again, you see a step forward. So the hazard ratio is circled here. This is a 50% advantage over a standard treatment. Um, if you happen to get to the MRD negative state, your survival is, is excellent. Um, the likelihood of getting to MRD negative was much higher if you had the monoclonal antibody. So the conclusions were that uh, this strongly supports the, this four drug combination as a standard of care. So this was shown last year. This statement's been made twice since with newer combinations. Okay, so things are moving quickly. So I won't belabor this really, but uh, sustained deeper response is associated with better survival. Uh, for us in the clinic, MRD negativity is relevant except that we can't do it routinely. So this is relevant for trials. Uh, we'll choose the treatment that gets you the best results but it's not practical routinely yet. Um, so things are about to change. There's a whole series of trials that are about to um, open and, and evolve. Um, I'll briefly touch on relapse. I'm not gonna talk much about it, but this is a series of trials published in the last two years or so that each one is a step forward. And I'll just point out hazard ratio here. I don't know if you've done much stats yet, but a hazard ratio of 0.37 suggests that the new combination, so in this case, this is adding that monoclonal antibody to the Revlimid and dexamethasone in a relapsed population is 63% better than the control arm. So that's, that's a huge difference in terms of clinical trials. And I'll show you that one briefly just because it's been just updated. Um, the median survival now uh, without progression, so progression-free survival, is now 45 months. So these are relapsed patients who are maintaining a remission for almost four years and to blow it up is, is this. It's important, this was just shown on, um, on the weekend actually at, in San Diego um, at the American meeting because this, this arm had just reached the median 
And you can see the standard, which is very good treatment, the median is 17 months, so you've more than doubled, almost tripled the standard. So some new stuff. There's a shot of uh, Halifax, just to uh, have the opportunity. That's the Queen Mary visiting. Um, and there's another quite large cruise ship, but you can see it dwar d d dwarfed by the uh, Queen Mary. Um, we have a street called Argyle Street, and if you have a street called Argyle Street, you might as well paint it like an Argyle sock. Uh, so this is the, um, do you guys know Argyle socks? No? Looks like this, basically. But um, th this is one of the uh, streets downtown. We have palm trees. They're, they're in pots, but uh, so they come in at this time of year. But um, in the summertime, they'll, they'll do okay. And this is a shot of the waterfront in Halifax. So this trial was uh, just shown on um, Tuesday. Today's Thursday. So this was shown in San Diego as a, a late-breaking abstract. Um, it's important now because this is first line. These are previously untreated patients. We're using a combination that's, again, this monoclonal antibody added to our standard. Um, this is a trial that we participated in and enrolled quite a number of patients. And it's important because, again, we have a hazard ratio that's showing an almost 50% improvement in terms of progression-free survival. Uh, I'd much rather be a patient on this arm than on the standard arm nowadays, even though I showed you this was a couple steps better than what we had prior to this, okay? So again, changing quickly. And again, if you happen to end up with a very deep remission, um, your likelihood of relapse is very, very low, okay? That's true whether you get, w whether you get this treatment or that treatment. Simply what's shown down here is the likelihood of getting to this state with this treatment is four times higher, okay? Or three times higher. Um, just touch on briefly what's coming. So th this, I'm not going to talk about this much, but th this, these are the mechanisms that are being targeted now. This is where the, where the action is in terms of clinical trials. Here's a couple kind of neat things. This is a, a drug that's just numbered, numbers and letters at this point. We're about to use this in a trial. Um, it's kind of interesting because it, it targets something called B-cell maturation antigens. So again, this is something on predominantly only on plasma cells or very mature B-cells. Um, and it uh, is a combination of a monoclonal antibody with a toxin attached to it. And the monoclonal antibody attaches to this uh, marker on a B cell. It's taken inside into a lysozyme. This toxin is released. This toxin is a tubulin uh, disruptor. So it shuts off the cell essentially. And that through that and other mechanisms is how it produces cell death. So interesting drug. We're sort of now moving from just a naked monoclonal antibody to monoclonal antibodies with, with, um, w with other purposes. Um, and you can engineer monoclonal antibodies to do different things. This, this is a variety of essentially engineered monoclonal antibodies now. Bite cells are just the um, small bits of the uh, immunoglobin that are directed in different ways. They're called, I'll show you in a second, they're called bites because they uh, bring together T cells as the effector cell with a malignant cell, okay? So they identify the malignant cell to the T cell and activate it, basically. And you can um, make them more durable by doing different things to them. Um, but here's a, um, a mechanism, and again, this is a trial that we're about to start um, with, with so-called bite uh, monoclonal antibody. It attaches to something on the T cell, attaches to CD3 on the T cell, and then it attaches to, again, this B cell maturation antigen on the, on the plasma cell. It turns on, that, that combination turns on the T cell, and the T cell kills the malignant cell. So you're using the patient's own immunity to kill the cancer. Here's another way to use it. So again, a bispecific antibody, this case um, directed against CD38 on plasma cells. Um, the other end of the antibody has something that will attach radioactive yttrium. That's yttrium-90 is what that, what that is. So basically, in this case, this has only been done on mice so far, but the mice are injected with the CD38 monoclonal antibody. That attaches to the plasma cells, and then they're injected with the radioactive yttrium. This is a drug that can be given to humans. It's used in other ways in uh, lymphoma. So this is something that's entirely possible in humans as well. And then CAR-T, that's what this stands for, C-A-R-T. You've probably heard some of this. Um, CAR-T is... Uh, is um, sort of the big highlight of myeloma <laughs> currently. Um, basically, peripheral blood, is, peripheral blood cells are collected um, 
T cells in particular, what we're interested in, that's collected at our center, for example, sent off for currently what's, um, what's sort of a secret process for various companies. Um, a lentivirus is, is used to transduce these, um, these T cells into recognizing the patient's own tumor, okay? There's a proliferation that happens, and then the cells are injected back into the, into the person, into the same patient. At the moment, it's very individualized and very expensive, so it's not practical in our practice, but, um, but it is being done in trials, and the cost will probably drop in time, and there have been some major um, successes with this mechanism. So has it made any difference? So just in the last couple of minutes, I can show you that, yes, it has. So this is SEER data from the American uh, Cancer Registries. This is old now, but you can see something changed in the mid-90s in the younger cohorts of patients. Likelihood of surviving 10 years was increased. Um, I can show you more recent data now from a Swedish registry, which basically shows the same thing. This is the five-year relative survival rate. So if it were 1.0, these patients would be living exactly the same time as their age match cohorts. You can see when we st when they started in the 1970s, um, myeloma patients were living, likelihood of living five years was around 20 or 30 percent compared to the cohort. Um, and that's increased over time, the younger populations, pretty flat in the older populations. And then again, with the recent advances since 2000, you can see the upward swing in the curve. So this is making a difference in terms of myeloma patients overall. And here again is um, SEER data from, uh, from the American registries, um, now broken down into white males, black males, white females, and black females. Um, two things, the red line is incidence, black line is mortality. Incidence is increasing, okay, in each case. And again, I told you earlier that it's a more common disease in people of African heritage. Um, but mortality rate in each case is, is dropping too. So these, these new drugs are making a difference. So why do we need more agents? Well, as you get to the end of the line, um, and you've had, basically these are two studies that in patients who have had all the available treatments to that point, survival is very short. So you can see median survival now we're measuring at less than a year. And if you look at a very refractory population, and this is recent data, um, those people who were refractory to, again, quad refractory means all of the drugs that were available in 2016, um, survival is three months. Okay, so this is a very dismal point in the disease. Here's some data when daratumumab came along, single agent. Um, now, median overall survival is 20 months. So those are those quad refractory patients who now had a new drug come along, and instead of three months, you're looking at 20 months. And um, taken from that same study, if you look at the patients who responded well, median overall survival actually is pretty good in, those in these guys that, um, that obtained the best response, but even if you obtained a um, minimal response, uh, it was still pretty good at 18 months, okay? This is uh, the cost toxicity, the toxicity to the wallet. Uh, these, these treatments are very expensive. This is in American dollars. Some of these combinations I'm talking about are, are a quarter of a million American dollars per year. Um, so, Briefly to conclude, um, myeloma is relatively complex in terms of its development its, its, um, in its treatment. Um, our current first line is lenalidomide and dexamethasone. That's changing currently. I think we'll move through two other first line treatments in the next year or so. And really where we want to get is to that new study that was shown on Tuesday uh, with the best treatments that are, that are available with the monoclonal antibody and the lenalidomide dexamethasone. The study that we're about to open actually in this population is monoclonal antibody with IMID with proteasome inhibitor. So we're using four drug combination, three different mechanisms, and uh, that will probably produce quite remarkable results. Um, there's a number of other first line studies coming and we're currently using drugs with very novel mechanisms. So there's a lot of hope there. Um, and through this, what I tried to show you is that myeloma patients are living longer can't really show it to you, but they're living better too. So these remissions are very good. Um, so I'll close there. Um, thank you all for the hospitality, the IMU. It's been a great uh, week and a half for me. And um, entertain any questions. And I should mention, I'm, I showed this slide uh, to a couple of students yesterday. This, this appears on Google. If you Google image uh, Dalhousie um, images, 
this, this is uh, somebody who started the IMU and graduated from Dalhousie, so he's holding his, uh, his Dal medical degree there. And um, he was training in uh, community health and epidem epidemiology at Dalhousie at that point. Um, and that's our, our medical school building. So open to questions. Yes. 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 It is. It's a good question. So solitary plasmacytomas, I didn't really touch on, but that's a somewhat unusual diagnosis at um, de novo, um, so without pre-existing myeloma. Um, it's a potentially curable situation if the patient doesn't have myeloma otherwise. So what we do prognostically, so, so lung, lung can occur, it's uh, commonly soft tissues or bone, but it can be anywhere. Um, so we would look for myeloma, try and determine whether the patient has systemic disease. If they don't, and if that, that's truly the only site of disease, lung, probably the tumor would be removed, and radiation plays a role otherwise. So if it were soft tissue or bone, the the um, the tumor is very radiosensitive, and the radiation oncologist would use a dose of radiation that's done with curative intent. Um, likelihood, if it's soft tissue, is actually pretty good. So cure rate's probably better than 50 percent. If it's bone, it's less than 50 percent, but still worth going after. So it's probably in the range of 30 percent. What we do see in you know these many lines of therapy that I've described. Part of the end stage can be, I've mentioned plasma cell leukemia, which is where the plasma cells come into blood. The other, the other end stage version that we're seeing much more of now is extramedullary myeloma. So the myeloma comes out and looks much more like an aggressive um, uh, solid tumor or, or an aggressive lymphoma. So you get lymph node involvement, you get CNS disease, and you get very short survival. But, uh, but it's a good question about um, solitary plasma cytomas. Yes. Yeah, certainly, certainly can be. Um, one of the sites I've, I must say I've not seen it in lungs specifically, but in the in the in the uh, trachea and the larynx is is one of the sites that this might go. That would be a site would use radiation alone. Um, likewise, bone or often soft tissue. It's not a surgical treatment so much as a, as a radiation treatment. Um, we don't tend to use uh, systemic or chemotherapy type treatments in that situation. Yeah. You're welcome. Yes. yes. For, for clinical criteria for complete remission and then relapse, you mean? Um, a lot of it is based on the lab work that you mentioned. So the, the definition of complete remission is evolving as the tests get better. So again, the complete remission, the, the definition goes back to when we had just electrophoretic studies and bone marrow. Um, now we have better tests. So, so the definition, uh, complete remission is still what was historically defined as complete remission. They've just changed the names of it. So now we have stringent, now we have complete remission by MRI, for example, complete remission by next-gen sequencing. Um, and I think that's probably the way it will continue. Um, those are tests that sort of beyond stringent complete remission in the clinic is something that we do look for. The minimal residual disease testing currently is a research tool. Uh, for most centers. Many American centers are doing it routinely. In Canada, um, it is a research tool. So we can do it. It's just that we don't do it routinely. Um, but I think that's where it is headed. I think we're headed to measuring minimal residual disease in all patients as we get these treatments that can bring disease burden very low. And then on relapse, it's the same thing. So uh, what we're doing in clinical trials currently is we're measuring minimal residual disease periodically. And actually, that study that we're about to open that I mentioned with the drug combination, very advanced treatment. The endpoint actually is not um, 
progression-free survival or overall survival, the, the primary endpoint is actually minimal residual disease negativity and maintenance of that. So, so not only do you have to get a very low point, but you have to maintain it uh, in order for it to be effective. So I think that's actually where it's headed. Okay. Yes. Yes. Yes, um, so, so very different. The, the, the diagnosis itself is somewhat arbitrary and was defined actually by Robert Kyle at Mayo Clinic, the fellow that I mentioned. Um, so I it's, it's arbitrarily 10% of your white cells, if 10% or greater or greater than two times 10 to the ninth cells in purple blood, that's plasma cell leukemia. It's a pretty arbitrary definition. In general, if you're seeing plasma cells in the purple blood, it's a bad sign. Um, but um, it, it implies an, a, a more aggressive state. So those, those plasma cells should stay in the bone marrow. If they're not, they've lost some of the adhesion properties, so they become a more, um, more immature, more aggressive uh, malignant cell, and they're peripheralizing. So, so the definition itself is somewhat arbitrary, but that still is the definition that's used. It, it is a much more difficult condition to treat. It's a mus much more advanced uh, malignancy. We treat it really in the same way, though. Um, we do have some successes, but most patients don't respond well to treatment, and most patients die fairly quickly. And it is one of the end stages of myeloma that we're seeing currently. But, but when a patient's diagnosed with that de novo, um, it's, a, it's a bad situation. They probably have some of those poor prognostic features that I mentioned on, on fish studies if, if you go looking for them. So. Okay. Good. Well, thank you very much.